So we are starting a new series. Happy December. This is my favorite time of the year. Not even just because it's our anniversary month. Happy anniversary, darling. Cheesy plug, I know, but it's a big one for us. It's a milestone anniversary, 25 years this year. Without God, it would not be possible. I am not exaggerating when I say that. We both have two failed marriages, a piece to prove that. So, uh, yeah, we'll just give him all the glory and all the praise. So let me move on from that public service announcement and move into this sermon series that we are beginning called The Line. And it is all about this moment in history from B.C. to A.D., that starts right here at this manger. And as Christians, in a Judeo-Christian society, we kind of just let our history start here and move forward. And in that, we miss the depth of transformation that Jesus brings to the world. And so, but we're going to start here, okay? We're going to start here. And so I invite you to, to read along with me Luke, we're going to start right at the manger, right away in the manger that we sang about, right here at this nativity that David made for the church. Isn't he awesome? Thank you, David. We're going to read Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. You can read along. I'm going to read it. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Pause and leave that scripture up there for a minute. This is one of my favorite passages because we picture the cartoon version of the angel choir showing up. The heavenly hosts were a kick-butt army. They are God's army. Warrior angels showed up in all the heavenly might, in all their strength, in all their everything, y'all, like makes Rambo look like a little teeny whip. The heavenly army showed up. And they didn't fight. And they didn't pull out their swords they sang, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. That was the message for the world to receive. That is the message for us to begin with. And that's kind of where we want to start the narrative. Like, why do we have to look back at, it, at BC? Why don't we just start there? <laughs> you know, last night I had the privilege of reading the Nativity story. That was one of our stations, and it was outside, away from all the stuff inside. And I was actually very pleasantly surprised at the number of families that came out to have the Nativity story read to them. And, and in the midst of that, one little child in particular caught my heart, her parents, actually, because she was just a wee little thing. Um, She was such a wee little thing. I think she was a she. She was all bundled up, but she was in, like, neutral clothing, so I wasn't even sure. But but I was like, well, she's a little young for this story, but I'll do my best because she wasn't maybe toddling. Like, I'm not sure she was maybe 15 months old or something. And her parents said, hey, I was a she, because they said, she's never too young for the story. And they did their best to keep her still. And it was just so incredible. But I want to just read this to you because why we go back. 
The Christmas, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like I did last night. The Christmas story began long, long ago, before the angel Gabriel told Mary she would have God's son, before the shepherds saw the angel and the wise men, before the star, even before the sun and the moon shone for the first time, before the first cows ever moved or before the first monkeys ever climbed, before Adam and Eve took their first walk in the Garden of Eden, God had a plan for Christmas. From the beginning of time, God's plan was Jesus. Colossians 1.17 says, Christ was there before anything was made, and all things continue because of him. Why Christmas? Why this? Why this distinct line in history that changes everything? Because God knew there would be the problem of sin. Because God knew that while he would have a temporary system of law to deal with sin, that wouldn't sustain things and it wouldn't be the ultimate solution. So Jesus, who was there before anything was made and in whom all things continue, Jesus determined to be the permanent solution for the problem of sin. (laughs) But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So let's go back to the field and the manger, back to the peace for those on whom his favor rests. What's the big deal? I mean, why is Jesus the center of peace and not just a centerpiece? How do we... Settle it in our hearts in such a way that Jesus is not the figurehead of our religion or a decoration in our homes for the holidays, but actually the center of everything that we rest our peace on 24-7, 365. So today we're going to back up about 700 years. We're going to read a passage from the prophet Isaiah. Um, Isaiah was a prophet to three kings, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He spent 60 years in ministry, which is why I said about seven years, because it was 680 to 740 BC, sorry. Um, And so, by the way, who was in the reading plan this past week? This is not a shaming session if you were in your reading plan this past week. So really cool. We cannot engineer this. We are not that smart, and we are definitely not that pre-planned. If you were in your reading plan this past week, we read about King Hezekiah. We set the reading plan three years ago. We set this sermon series three months ago. We set a four-and-a-half-year reading plan. Y'all wonder why I go, that pesky God That's exactly why we could not make this stuff up the way he just aligns things so perfectly. Side note, some people are still asking me where's the reading plan. It's in a basket sitting out on the table. Grab one. Okay, so with that, 700 years back up, there's Isaiah this prophet, and he is a prolific writer of the Messiah who's going to come. He actually writes four complete poems about the servant that would come to lead. Now, I'll clue you in. I have a degree. One of my master's degrees is in organizational leadership. Servant leadership is kind of a new thing in in culture out there, maybe the last 30 years, 20 years in particular. Servant leadership has been a thing in history through through scriptures for over 2,000 years now. Imagine that, Jesus setting the trend on things. Hmm teaching us how things should go. Anyway, of the four poems Isaiah writes, the one we're going to go through pieces of today, y'all got this paper and you're like, oh, we're going to be here till three o'clock. No, we're not. It's okay. We're not going to do the whole thing. I promise. That's why you got the whole paper. Um, This one is considered to be the greatest and it is all about this servant. Before we get into the heart of it, I want to give you guys some mechanics. If you've got a pen, dig around and get one. If you're, if you're online, grab your Bibles out, grab a note paper, grab a pen. You want to write some things down. They've got pens out there. You can grab them. Um, this is a five-paragraph or five-stanza poem. You'll see there's a little break in the lines. And I want to give you a couple titles for those five paragraphs, all right? 
Why didn't I put them on the paper for you? Because no matter how I annotated them, you would think that was part of the scripture. And I am not going to set you up like that or set me up like that, okay? So um, let's see. And then we're done with teaching because then this is all an issue of the heart. It's probably one of the greatest heart issues I'm ever going to teach you. So these five paragraphs, the first and the fifth are all, Isaiah is talking all about what will happen in the future with this servant leader. Two, three, and four, it is like somebody lifted up Isaiah and set him at the manger and at the cross and at the tomb. Two, three, and four, it is like they picked him up and moved him 700 years forward and he watched Jesus get crucified and resurrected. So with that, above verse 13, I want you to write the successful servant dash will. Above 53, which by the way is chapter 53, not verse 53. I want you to write the slighted servant. In other words, he was slighted. He didn't get what he deserved. They shunned him. Above verse 4, I want you to write the suffering servant. Next column. Above verse 7, I want you to write the submitted servant. And above verse 10, I want you to write the satisfied, the satisfied servant. Well, we are absolutely not going to go through this whole text today, I encourage you this week to spend time in the greatest story of human history that's being foretold in these verses. So, okay, we have those. You guys got some titles. You'll dig deeper in bridge builders groups, but it's time to get to the heart of the matter. So we had the angels proclaiming the birth of Christ, proclaiming peace on earth, goodwill to men, proclaiming what would be. And if we have chapter, uh, chapter 52, verse 13 of Isaiah, then it says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. That matches what the angel said, right? Like that's the picture we have of Jesus, isn't it? Amen? Like, that's what we want from our Messiah, raised up and highly exalted. This is what will happen. Of course, he goes on and says, just as there were many who were appalled at him, he was disfigured, he was beaten beyond recognition because that's what happened at the cross. It says he will sprinkle many nations. He will shut the mouths of kings and he will teach them, he will be proclaimed. I didn't, we don't have that up there. What I really want to get at in this first little bit is there, there is this proclamation from Isaiah that the, the Messiah will be exalted, but that is a future thing. And there's a lot of things that have to happen before he will be exalted. And, and so before the Christmas story can happen, all the other stuff has to happen. But why does the other ha stuff have to happen? And the other stuff has to happen because the wages of sin is death. And if we're really honest, that's hard for us to grasp. 
Like in our Judeo-Christian culture, we live under grace. We don't live under the wages of sin is death. I mean, yes, the right, there's right and wrong, but there's redemption. And whether our culture is walking in a Judeo-Christian mindset right now or not, that is what we were founded on, the generations before us were founded on. We don't live in an honor-shame culture. We don't live in a culture where the wages of sin is death. And, and we definitely don't die by an honor-shame culture where the wages of sin is death. Y'all have to understand, in other cultures around the world that are honor-shame cultures, in Middle Eastern cultures, in, in, in many cultures, in many tribal cultures, honor culture is a real thing. To bring shame upon yourself for your sins is to bring shame upon your entire family. Like, we can't conceive an honor killing. We cannot conceive that there would ever be a time where a father would be responsible to execute his daughter for having sex outside of marriage. Cannot conceive it. And yet, there are cultures all around the world where it is not just some far-flung thing. It is required because until it happens, shame is on the entire family. And unless it happens, their honor is never restored. That kind of thing blows our mind. And God never required that, but, but God did require that sin be atoned for. And in the Old Testament, there were some sins that had to be atoned for with execution, yes, but sin always had to be atoned for with blood. And until that debt was satisfied, there was consequence. Now, I want to tell you that God has always been a God of mercy. This, this whole idea that God was such a jerk in the Old Testament is not true. Like, reread your Old Testament. The very first animal sacrifice in the Old Testament was at the hands of God. When Adam and Eve sinned and were being cast out of the garden, God sacrificed the first animal to create clothing for Adam and Eve to protect them, even as he cast them out of the garden. I don't know much more of a compassionate father that there could be than to say, here is your consequence, but let me protect you from some of the harshness of the consequence that you chose, and let me sacrifice something to do it because I love you that much. There's always been compassion but there's always been a requirement to atone for sin. Under the law, blood sacrifice was required. Atonement was required. I, I want to tell you, um, in the reading this week, right, we were in Second Chronicles, and they had set aside um, the king before, let me see, Second Chronicles 29. The king before Hezekiah had ignored, he had ignore God. He had done all this bad stuff. Hezekiah says, our parents were unfaithful. Did they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. God, they forsook God. They just have to do a little bit of blood sacrifice. He had to send an entire army of priests into the temple. They cleansed the temple for 16 days. And then they sacrificed seven bulls, seven lambs, seven rams, seven goats. They had to do all this stuff. And if we go back to the original law, if we go back to the original law, there was sin. If we go back to the original, there we go. All right. Mm. If we go back to the original law, when you committed a sin, you had to make atonement for that sin. You were required to get an animal and make a blood sacrifice. And, and so, and that, by the way, that didn't atone for your sin all in itself. Once a year, the high priest had to go in and make a sacrifice for all Israel's sin. And I know it's really hard for us to conceive that, but I want you to consider this. Because we just get to say we're sorry, God, right? But they didn't. So if I'm here and it's the day after the Day of Atonement, 
and I get mad at my husband, and I lose my temper, and I say some things I shouldn't, and I sin, then I have to carry that. And I carry it around, and that's not a big deal. I make my blood sacrifice, but then I lose my temper with my kids, and then maybe I am a little more frustrated with my husband, and I covet my neighbor's husband, and I pick up a little more sin. But I, but I take my dove to the altar, and I take my dove to the priest and have him make my sin offering sacrifice. But I'm still carrying it around because I got 380 more days till the Day of Atonement. And I'm carrying that weight around, and I'm carrying that burden around, and, and then I dishonor my mother-in-law. That's not okay. And then I get frustrated with God. That's not okay. And then I have a lot of laundry to get done, and I need to feed the kids. And there's some law in the Old Testament that after my monthly cycle, I have to go through a ritual cleansing. But I don't have time for that because i got to do the laundry, and I have to cook the dinner. So I skip the ritual cleansing. And even if nobody knows it, that's a sin. And it's a pretty big sin. So it's not one rock, but it's three rocks. And I still have 150 days to go. And this whole bundle of sin I'm carrying around is getting really, really, really heavy. And I can't do anything about it because that's the way it was. Are you starting to get the picture? And that's over the little things because under grace, sin is sin is sin is sin. <laughs> but under the law, some sins required a whole lot more than other sins. And if I commit a really big sin, then we can just put all the rocks in here. And it's a good thing this bag has two straps because I'm going to need them both. And I'm going to need to walk through everything with them. And then we get to the Day of Atonement. And the high priest goes in and he makes the atonement. You can read about that in Leviticus if you really want to because Leviticus is the most exciting book in the whole Bible. <laughs> Just kidding. God, they know I'm kidding. I'm not, yeah. And, and even after they make this great sacrifice and, and, and do all these things, God says, this is to be the lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether you're native or foreigner. You must on this one day of atonement that will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins for a day till you pick up one more rock. And maybe you make it three days, four days, five days. Don't raise your hand. How many days? Think about it. How many days do you make it without a single sin? Because that's how long you have to wait till the next day of atonement in the next year. And not to be punny, but how heavy is that? How much weight is that? And in the midst of that, there's no way out of that. And it's hard for us to conceive that because we don't live in that culture. We, we used to live in a right and wrong culture, Right? And in a right and wrong culture, which is 10 steps away from an honor culture and a wages of sin and death culture, that's bad enough. But we don't even live in a right and wrong culture anymore. We live in a right and if I happen to get caught, I'm wrong culture. And if y'all think I'm kidding, let's talk about the entire lawsuit over the fact that speed cameras aren't legal because nobody's actually there to catch me speeding. It's not a human being. I'm sorry. What's the law? Were you speeding? I think it's probably been like 14 years ago, my very first sermon. <laughs> By the way, I found out on a Tuesday afternoon that I was preaching on Sunday morning and I was preaching four sermons at New Life. 
It was great. It started Saturday night. Yeah, all the ministry students thank me that I never do that to you, ever. I had to preach you on living God's way. And I made this funny joke about not getting a fish violation because people were complaining that people with the New Life fishes on their car, but it could be any church, were really committing some egregious traffic violations, and it was not okay. And it's like, don't put a fish on your car. Everybody kept saying, don't put a fish on your car if you're going to drive like a crazy person. Can I suggest, folks, it's not about the fish in the car, but Jesus in your heart? Like, I'm not suggesting that four to nine miles an hour over or occasionally scooting through a light that happens to turn red is something. I am talking about driving like a maniac, risking someone else's life, or if they pull you over, it's not a speeding ticket, it's a reckless driving ticket. I'm talking about that kind of selfishness. If you're going to drive like that, the issue is not the fish on the car, it's let the Holy Spirit get hold of your heart because that's not okay. That's living in a sin or in a right or if I happen to get caught, I'm wrong culture. And that's not what it's about. But y'all are like, could we get back to the manger? This is not nice. You said you liked December. What's happening? What's happening? All right, back to another difference. Let me ask you this. Because, okay, they had the Day of Atonement. They could make their little sacrifices. Who in this room has experienced the, like, had that moment or many moments where you have experienced the presence of God? Like where you have had a crisis in your life, or you have had a great, and you have experienced, like you just know the Holy Spirit is present. Guess what? Over here, unless you're the high priest, who might once in his life draw the lot and get to go into the Holy of Holies, And I'll give you some perspective. You know how they say, like, you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than hitting the lottery? You have a better chance of hitting the lottery than being the high priest who gets to go in the Holy of Holies. <laughs> Unless you're that guy with that luck, or you happen to be a king or a prophet or one of the very few people on whom the Spirit fell in the Old Testament, you don't ever get that over there, before Jesus, before Jesus bridged the gap between sin and death. It's never there because sin separated us from God in such a way. And that was the reality. And then here comes Isaiah, and he's talking about the Messiah. And, and he goes on, you're like, Pastor Jen, I'm getting pretty scared. We've done one verse on this paper, and we're pretty far in. It's okay. It's okay. Isaiah says, there is a Messiah, there is a servant coming. And this problem that we have, this problem that we have that we can't fix, he is going to take care of it for us. He is going to fix it for us. If we look at Isaiah, um, I'm actually going to skip down to verse 4. If we look at Isaiah under the suffering servant, verses 4 to 6, we can read that together. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God. On the cross, the one, the baby in the manger who grew into a man, he got on the cross and he took on all the pain. They pierced him with a spear, but it is our sin that pierced him just as much or more than the soldier who lifted that spear. And in verse 5 where it says the punishment that brought us peace was on him, I want you to go back to Luke 
verse, chapter 2, verse 14, where the angel said, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Punishment that brought us peace was on him. From this moment, from way before this moment, but from this moment, it was pronounced what would happen on that cross so that our transgressions, our sins, would be taken care of. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. It says, like sheep who have gone astray. And I want to take us back to that moment in the crowds. If you guys will remember, there's a moment after John the Baptist is killed, who's Jesus' cousin, and he is exhausted from ministry, and he gathers the disciples, and he says, we're going to go across the way, and we're going to get some rest. And they go across the way, and they land, and the crowds have followed him over there. And he is exhausted, and he is grieving, and all he wants to do is rest. But he turns to the disciples And it says he was anguished and he had great compassion because he saw the crowds and they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to minister. That's where we get the feeding of the 4,000 from. Because in the midst of it all, like sheep who had gone astray, Jesus still came with an answer and a solution. This passage goes on, and I want to encourage you to dig into it throughout the week. The silent servant, Jesus never said a word as he faced the persecution, as he faced all the accusers after the cross, after his arrest. He was silent. Um, There's a lot of verses in there that we'll dig into in our bridge builders groups that lead to the submitted servant. But I want to take us down to the satisfied servant fulfilling his role as high priest because Before we were created, and when Jesus entered the world as a baby, he knew what his responsibility was, and he said yes in his submission to this role in verses 10 to 12. Verse 10 says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And I want to go back to the fact that Jesus was always the plan. And what kind of love is that that God has for us, that Jesus is always the plan, and yet God created us, and yet God breathed life into us, and yet God gave us free will, knowing what it would cost It says, after he suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Isaiah is telling us that Jesus is going to pay everything to take this cost of sin from us. He is going to be the atoning sacrifice. We see in verse 10 that it says, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he is going to be the required guilt offering for all mankind, and he, the high priest himself, will make his own offering as the perfect sin offering that he will live. It goes on to say that for he bore the sins of many and he made intercession for his transgressors. There's a ton of theology in here. But here's the reality of this passage broken down. Under the law, before this manger, on this side of this line, under the law, sheep died for the shepherd. Under grace, the good shepherd died for the sheep. Under the law, sheep were forced to die so the shepherd could be free for a year. And under grace, the good shepherd chose to die to pay the sins of mankind forever. We never have to pick this burden up again. 
Are we called to confess? Yes. Are we called to repent? Yes. Are we called to say we're sorry? Yes. Are we called to live to righteousness? Yes. Jesus came that we have life and have it in abundance, which means living right ways, doing right things, not because we have to, because we get to, because it brings fulfillment. But we never have to pick up that burden of sin ever again, and we're never separated from God again. See, on this side, the choice of accepting the servant's gift of grace and atonement is freely offered, and we can leave that side and the burden of sin and its separation from God behind. Romans 10.9 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. John 1, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Where before the burden was on us to bring to give, to sacrifice. Jesus came out of heaven and walked and lived among us so that forever, forever, we would never have to go back to that side of the line and that forever we could walk free of the burden of sin, free of guilt and of shame. And in full relationship, never again separated from the love of a father, ever. We doing okay, church? Can we read that last passage together? Um, do we have a, was it Corinthians? Colossians? Yep. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The choice of accepting grace is freely offered. I could not preach this sermon. I could not, we could not as a church talk about this line and the difference it makes on the issue of sin without setting this table. You see, all that we talked about in Leviticus and sin offerings and blood being sprinkled and everything that had to be poured out and atonement As New Testament believers in this culture, in this time, we can so miss the significance of Jesus saying, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you as an atonement. This has been done for you as a new covenant so that you never have to experience the consequences, again. Today, um, so confessions from a pastor. A hundred different times, I would rather preach uh, how to improve your life with scripture, sermon, practical steps on improving your marriage, improving your finances, improving your parenting, improving this and that with scripture, because it's all in there. And that'll make things better. 
and it is terrifying to try to talk to a North American culture in this day and age about the wages of sin is death, and Jesus came to take that off your shoulders because we just don't get it. But it's the most important thing I will ever try my best to communicate to you and to myself. And so I'm here today to say, as we walk into this Christmas season, as we look at this line between B.C. and A.D., and as today it's on sin, and next week it's on equality, and the following week it's on transformation, which are much lighter topics, if we get today right, if you recognize that sin actually separates us from God and Jesus existed and created us knowing what he would do to bring us back to him and did it anyway because he loves you and me that much and what we actually celebrate at Christmas is that unimaginable love. then that is the greatest gift I could ever even begin to communicate to you.